Um, I think we were on 13.5.4 because um, this looked familiar to me, right? Everybody remember that from last time? Those of you who were on the call at least. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, okay. Um, global variables. So this is, so basically, let's see here. I think this is sort of a switch. This is not really related to the last section. I guess they're just kind of doing a bunch of different little uh, grid search tools in this section 13.5.4. Um, so usually you can use the values in your local environment or your global environment model objects. Um, so environment, they give a little definition here. So you can set a coefficient penalty and, you know, if you're not, I'm not really sure what the point of this is because like you're just setting a, a variable value and you're not really tuning it. Um, so maybe, maybe we'll understand that. Um, so these are called quotures. These are objects that track both the name. Anybody really have an, I would guess, more intuitive idea of what a quotient is? I mean, it comes from tidy eval, right? Yeah, I guess you're right, because the quoted versus like the non-quoted um, parameters, values, whatever. Oh, yeah, okay. The reason, like, yeah, so the, the main thing that they're saying here, I think, is because the important part is that the closure brings with it the environment. Yeah. So, so you, not, you not only have the 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 thing but you also know where it where you're pulling that thing from yeah that's a good yeah okay i guess that's kind of right there in the text um <laughs> so no, but like yeah I, I it seems important i guess but i don't fully grasp necessarily why right at the moment <laughs> like yeah because you can definitely have variables that are named the same thing like nested within a function or something Mm -hmm. but you use them in different ways or something like that and yeah local run into, versus global environment you can run into problems really quickly if you do that yeah so now kind of going back to the parallel um so basically you have the environment you have right the, the model specification you have the object so the, the call out here is that when such a model is valued with parallel workers it may fail um if they don't have access to the global environments. That's kind of interesting, um, depending on the particular technology. I'd be curious to understand more about the particular technology uh, for parallel processing. I don't know enough about parallel processing to say how one figures out if a particular technology is uh, good or not, other than, hey, they, it failed because <laughs> and that's how you figure it out uh so anybody has any uh, insight yeah. about that uh laura uh, sorry about the background noise i don't know sure. if you can hear me yeah yeah we can so hear in, in this in this case the parallel uh evaluation of the model is just that you that there is two parallel uh package that you can mm -hmm. use yeah i know that yeah, and, and you said that, that that means that they said to do parallel and uh, uh, so set the computer able to work with more than one core in a way that the, the model uh, is fit faster. Yeah, I understand that. I understand that about parallel processing, but I, my question was related to the particular technology. Um, they're not really giving... Um, a lot of detail about like what kind of particular technology would would cause this to to fail um so i was just curious if anybody you know said oh this kind of particular technology will work either from an experience or this kind of won't work um but maybe if, no, if nobody has experience with that that's fine i'm just throwing it out there to the group yes i just, just, I just uh, yeah. go ahead 
Sorry, Frederica. No, um, I just wanted to, to say that uh, parallel uh, processing is a, a quite wide um, topic. And basically, the, what the computer does uh, is to uh, split the work within uh, cores inside the computer. Mm -hmm. So in a way that can run the whole thing faster. Um, I'm sure that Ryan maybe <laughs> has some uh, uh, knowledge uh, about that or am I wrong? Definitely. Uh, yeah. So you're talking about your process IDs. The process IDs are managed by the, uh, I guess the bus, the, the, the actual motherboard bus of what gets routed to what CPU. Um, in, in, in reference to just parallel computing in general, the idea would be that you're, you've got two, um, I don't know, workhorses, draft horses. And when I say two, it could be of any infinite number, just as big as the CPU can handle. So when you're, when you're looking at a computer that has two cores or four cores or eight cores or whatever the, the value is, what you're doing is splitting that operation or possibly multiple yeah. operations into each separate CPU. So therefore you get a faster output. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, I, I understand that my, okay, my, okay. yeah. So I actually use it. My it's question is more related to this statement where it chooses the to particular the technology, this particular Correct. technology. So what is an example of a think... particular technology that would uh, may lead something to fail? Uh, in terms of not being able to get the uh, use that quotient, so to speak. So let's let's talk about like Spark as an example, or I don't know Hadoop does it as well, but I don't know if that's on the on the CPU side. It is on the on the database side. Um, so Spark as an example, you are executing a access point in a multi-threaded manner, parallel manner. Um, so if it were to fail, then you're missing half the information you're required to have to make the calculation. So therefore you're gonna export an error. I think that's what we're talking. When such a model is evaluated with parallel workers, it may fail depending on the particular technology that is used for a parallel processing. The workers may not have access to the global environment. So uh, a great, great, great example of this would be like Docker. Uh, or possibly mm -hmm. uh, the Kubernetes concept. And I'm only bringing those two into light because I'm, I'm arguing right now with Kubernetes uh, to try and get <laughs> a service up and running. Um, so it's not important that you know the nodes inside of Kubernetes uh, or, or the, the pods, I guess, inside. It, they just kind of manage themselves. It's more of just treating the Kubernetes cluster as a server, right? So don't get too caught up in the undertone of what is happening because that's all really things that should already work. And if they don't, then you've got a bigger problem on your hands. If we were to use like Spark and send, you know, multiple threads to the, the access point for calculation, yada, 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 the comment is, does the, is there an awareness of a particular service or a particular technology that would prevent us so that if we do, or we do not receive uh, an input it will automatically fail uh, or, or it'll cascade into mm. a point where you can't go any further. It'll start to spit out other problems. Um, that's the only thing I can come up with. And I'm sorry, Frederica, for, thank you for jumping in. Uh, that's the only idea that I can think of in the back of my mind where this is coming in. That's, I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, I don't have a lot of experience with those tools. My company right. is quite uh, 1995 when it comes to technology. <laughs> no, like literally. And uh just getting our studio connect and our studio server was like sure. a fairly big thing. So yeah, the Hadoop and uh, Kubernetes, this Spark, like all technologies that uh, hoping to learn more about and get more experience with. So well, the, the thing above, and, and just to highlight, there's the comment about closure. I'm, 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 I'm thinking, I'm pretty sure that it has to do with uh the local environment of when the process is running. So it doesn't have the access to the larger spectrum of, you know, uh, resolving uh, pathways. It only knows mm -hmm. it's one little area of, of sandbox that you've put this variable in and, and it can work inside there. It can't go out and find other information on another location. If that's mm -hmm. in cache, if that's on your RAM, if that's in, in your hard drive. Um, so the quotient idea uh, supports the dot, dot, dot. And I, I think that was in one of our book clubs recently. 
the dot 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 notation is kind of like you're accessing a variable inside the process, but that okay. variable has no idea where anything else is going on. It, it, it will only work within that function. Um, that's why piping is so important as you pipe from one function to the next, because you've set up that large string of access, all of those variables within that um, exchange can access each other, the dot, dot, dot. Yeah. If, you, if you go and try and pull out that variable in another function outside of that string, it's going to give you an error because it doesn't exist. It has no idea where it's at or how to access it. Yeah. You know, I've seen the dot, dot, dot. I think it's some yeah. ggplot code. Yes. Haven't really used it. Uh, I think well, it's like density it, it, functions, but yes. Uh, I think I recall John saying it's like a placeholder of it doesn't really matter. It's just there. And mm -hmm. you let the function or the, or the computer, the R under the hood do its own thing. Um, you're just making it as like a shorthand uh, yes. saying there's a whole bunch of things going on in here, but I'm not documenting it or I don't care about it. The function will take care of itself. Um, Oh, that, you mean in the arguments, dot, dot, dot. Well, like, I was like thinking dot, 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 right. surrounding no. some of the, um, uh, the ggplot layers. I think some of the density layers. Well, that okay, might, that makes sense. That might work too. Um, let me see. I'm trying to open up my past window. Oh, is that is that when you're using a, a computer thing inside ggplot too, where it's like dot, dot, yeah, density? Yeah, dot, 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 and dot, oh, dot, and the yeah, dot 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 is like miscellaneous arguments that might be passed to the uh, to the three. function. Okay. Three dot. Oh sure. Oh thanks. But Thank you, Ryan. The link that I just sent, it's the third bullet that I'm trying to highlight. It says uh, quos is a bit different in other function is that it returns a list of quotures. You can apply several expressions directly. Um, example is quos foo bar. Uh, but more importantly, you can also supply dots. So quos in parentheses, dot, dot, dot. In the later case, expressions forwarded through dots are captured and transferred to the quotient. The environments bundled in these quotients are the ones that where the code was supplied as arguments, even if the dots were forwarded multiple times across several function calls. I'm still a little unclear on the definition of quotient. Um, and mm -hmm. every time I Google it, it only points me at R vocabulary terms, which yeah. tells me that it's a very R centric thought process. I just need to figure out what was the, what was the early baseline before they came up with this vocabulary term. Yeah, that makes sense. Hmm. I think in, I think in that case, in, in tidy eval, the dot, dot, dots, the key for them is that if you see the, in your, in your link, it's like, oh, foo and bar are specifically spelled out, but you can give it, you could give it five variables um and it would wrap them all appropriately for the ensuing functions that need them so that to me that's the real that's what the dot 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 captures it captures kind of everything else that isn't defined mm -hmm. um in the function upstream and then prepares it can prepare that for downstream use i've, I've only used it a couple of times in that regard writing functions kind of for myself um to manipulate play our like things yeah but it does work and it works pretty darn well and it's pretty darn flexible too so oh that's cool okay well i guess we probably better move on um we don't understand it but we're just gonna go <laughs> yeah well i guess it's only 8 45 i don't think i don't think uh steve is gonna join us so i guess we have plenty of time sure um okay Let's see here. Um, so basically the two exclamation points, which I think I had never had a really good under explanation. I've seen this before, right? But an explanation of what this is. Um, it's funny how you get into habits where I can write pipes and like do all kinds of stuff with, you know, map and manipulating things <laughs> and stuff. It's like, oh yeah, well, what is the use case for this? So, okay. Um, so you're basically splicing this value into an object. So instead of, uh, we're not really considering the environment here, it's a quotient, it's still a quotient, but it's really, the expression is 0 0.1, which of course was defined up here. Hmm. Uh, so the value is there instead of the reference to the object when you have multiple external values interest. So you do the three, ah, uh, yes, Stan, for those of us, I guess nobody here is in the Statistical Rethinking Book Club, but yeah, you can do multiple of the multi Monte Carlo, Markov chain Monte Carlo arguments. You're doing uh, 
Stan, uh, Bayesian linear regression with Stan. So, and then these would be those specific ones, which would be, uh, of course, chains, cores, and iterations. Um, recipe selectors, um, let's see. So column name, string subset, I guess this is, this is from Stringer. Um, and then you're just pulling out chapter two variables. I assume CH stands for chapter, maybe not. Um, it would be better to reference them pro programmatically, yeah, instead of hard coding. Um, so then you have, you're setting up the recipe here. This is the cell data step spatial sign. Um, anybody used this um, this kind of step before in any of their work? I don't really work a lot with spatial data, so I, probably not the best person to comment. <laughs> I used it before, but not not this function. But I've done spatial stuff before. Okay, I mean, Ryan, Ryan, you may have too. But have you you've never used this either? I have not. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. I'm just asking because I'm trying to get an idea of what exactly step spatial sign is. But maybe that's sort of an aside from the main point of this. And then instead of saying so, you can do all of this, right? Or you can just all the three exclamation points. Um, oh yeah, I'm just like they is have this, the. Uh, is this from uh, receipt as well? It's from yeah. recipe. Yeah. It, it, would spatial sign be like GPS data? Um, Maybe. It says, uh, yeah. it says it takes a recipe step that will convert numeric, numeric data into projection on a unit sphere. Correct. <clears throat> well, there's not usually, sure I quite get that. No, there's usually some kind of an orthogonal system, like a grid, mm -hmm. right? Wrapped Interesting. around that globe that it's, it's also respectful for. Um, but I will look into this. I am not familiar with the call. Oh, I'm not expecting anybody to do. I was just curious, you know, throwing it out there because it's like, hey, maybe somebody knows about this and uh, it's not me at this point. <laughs> so uh, so they like that basically this is better because we have everything embedded right in the, <coughs> excuse me, the recipe objects. This is the preferred, preferred way. Um, Okay, racing methods. Let's see, it's been a little bit since I looked at this. So um, we need to basically fit all resamples before any tuning parameters can be evaluated. So we wanna be able to limit, eliminate, excuse me, truly bad parameter candidates. Um, so like futility analysis and clinical trials, it's like, why continue the trial if this drug is obviously doing really poorly and can potentially harm someone. So racing methods, um, kind of that for machine learning, um, a multi-layer perceptron, perceptron tuning process. Sounds very cool with a regular grid. Um, so that looking, so basically we're gonna say, okay, looking at some of these parameter candidates, right? Let's look at the first few folds. Um, and then the, the outcome is going to be just basically under the ROC curve and it's, it's a, um, we're going to be, be eliminating essentially or discarding as just is how they describe it, certain kinds of uh, parameters, combinations. So um, let's see, the loss of ROC. So this is the loss of the area under the curve. Um, so we have one sided confidence intervals, right, relative to the best performing parameters. So this would be, I guess, the best performing, right? No loss. And then over here, right? This kind of pre-processor model one, pretty bad, a lot of loss of AOC, A, I'm sorry, AUC. And then kind of somewhat better as we go up. And then these ones all kind of straddle uh, the curve. So we can't really eliminate them at this point. Um, yeah, so again, it's overlapping zero and that 95% confidence interval. So then these are those six ones that remain are resampled more. Um, we kind of just throw out the rest of these. 
So this is a, do you all want me to play this or? Sure. Okay. I think I looked at this before and I, it's been a couple of weeks. So let's see what it is. Yeah. So yeah, we're, it's not really a lot of explanations. And then, so basically you're, as you compare, I guess you get more and more narrow, right? And then eventually you're left up, left with um, the, one. the one. It's like Highlander for models. <laughs> uh, so, although I'm guessing they, this is interesting, they retaining. So the best is this iteration 10 testing. Uh, so the process continues, a new models fit, right? You, more some models discarded. So it's kind of interesting. Um, what, is this, what is this little call out here? Um, as long this can be more efficient than a basic grid search, as long as the analysis is fast. And then of course you have to have some parameter settings to have poor, poor performance. And then also uh, when the model does not have the ability to exploit models, some model predictions, I'm guessing. Oh, thank you, Federica. Uh, so this is kind of I'm, some model. I'm, I'm thinking some sort of um, nested model, but what are y'all in plain English, as I like to say, what, it, what, is, what does this mean, this phrase mean to, to you? Anybody have an insight? Wasn't, wasn't one of the models that we talked about previously um, the type of model where you didn't have to rerun? Yeah, I think it was a PCA um, or partial least squares. And you Something could just like kind that. of, yeah. And you could just pick and choose pieces out of it and they were pre-computed so you didn't have to recompute yeah. everything. You could just decide I'm how many components. That's, maybe, that's, maybe that's what it's talking about. So when you do yeah. not have that ability. So if you were to try and do that on a PLS model or whatever it is, mm -hmm. that would be maybe not beneficial. Perform It would be poor performance or something. Yeah, or, or maybe it would be... Uh, it wouldn't be necessary, right? Because you've yeah. already done all the computations ahead of time. So you can just start looking, see what happens as you increase or decrease the number of components in that case. That'd be yeah, my guess. It's a, yeah, it's an interesting thought. Sure. Okay, well, we'll move on. If anybody has any thoughts about that, we can come back and discuss further. Cool. Fine tune package. Uh, another package I had not heard of prior to this chapter. Um, so the tune race ANOVA function, right? You basically do an ANOVA model to test for the um, statistical significance of the different configurations. So the filtering above the cool is shown. This is the syntax for that. Get your cell folds, right? You 20 grid, those parameter specifications. Uh, we're looking, this is our metric set and then control. The control is set to uh, control race and I guess we don't want we, we don't want we want to have it be verbose so we can see what's going on so that this is a, as opposed to the tune grid that um I think it was tune grid that we saw yeah there we go earlier so and what they are using an MLP workflow so I'm trying to remember which one that was um so then you can use the show best same as um, you know, we've looked at previously, and then we find it's the one with eight hidden units, relatively high-ish penalty, I think. And um, epochs, 177, right? Number of components, 15. So suit very, very, right? Between these two, um, I mean, really close. It looks like to me, just looking at it, but this one is slightly better. So these are some um, other methods that we can look at if you're interested in reading academic papers on the subject, relatively recent too, except for this one. <laughs> that one goes uh, all the way back to the 50s. So this, this was a pretty intense chapter, at least for me, and maybe it's just my 
um, relatively, I did a little bit just on some toy examples with Tune Grid, but not, not with a lot of the more specialized methods later in the chapter. So um, they're basically saying we looked at uh, regular, non regular grids, right? How you can tune, you can use that doing the grid underscore whatever. Tune grid can evaluate the candidate sets of models using resampling. So we can finalize the model recipe workflow to update the parameter models. That's, of course, the benefit of the tuning grid. Um, downside can be computationally expensive or if you know your data, you know reasonable outcomes, you can perhaps eliminate some of that um, expense. Uh, so they're kind of giving us the, all of that comes down to, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I guess we're, the data analysis code that we reuse in the next chapter is just basically this V fold on the cells. So we're going to a different kind of tuning, uh, tuning which is iterative search in chapter 14. So yeah, I guess 20, 20, then we'll get into more specialized topics of, of model selection, et cetera. So any comments, questions, corrections, thoughts that occurred to anyone while I was sort of stumbling my way through this? <laughs> Did, did well, thank you very much. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's, it's new stuff. And I think, at least for me, maybe not for as many of you, but uh, we're mostly new stuff. I've done a little bit of the stuff in this chapter. So it's always good to be stretching your limits, I guess. Yeah. So I suppose when it, when it, when it push comes to shove, it's all about like actually putting it to use and when you mm -hmm. should and shouldn't put it to use. And there was, you know, those little boxes with the robot with the blank eyes, you know, were, were like call outs for very specific scenarios that so far I haven't experienced. So. Yeah, no, I agree. I, uh, it's, I always think about these things in terms of like the time series use case. Um, and it's just a little bit different animal, you know? So I don't know. I, uh, I would, I need to sort of scour the internet for cases where this is used in a time series context because that of course the, the cross validation looks quite a bit different in that scenario so okay yeah good cool well so steven next week maybe if he can make it yeah maybe, maybe i misunderstood i thought i thought he was gonna but i thought that would take not as long as it did for me to finish up that chapter but there is still a fair amount so i guess it works out well that he will he'll be doing it next time so good anything else happy april fools i guess yeah thank you so much I, I, yeah, I'm hoping nobody posts anything super scary. I saw something where it was like, the world is too crazy right now. We don't need anybody <laughs> scaring us all, or, you know, uh, bringing, well, you know, with some April Fool's joke. Of course, a lot of the stuff that would have been April Fool's like 20 years ago is now totally real life. So, I mean, uh, life and, I don't know, life imitates art or satire i don't know but comes around for sure the stack overflow joke is a little bit yeah let me look at that real quick it's okay i, I changed mine to windows 3.1 which i enjoyed oh wow that does take you back that is uh and the, the definitely first one very that, 2000 the first, one, <laughs> the first one i got was the uh, 3d one where you have you're supposed to have the red and blue glasses i don't have those though so i don't know what it actually looks like or yeah. if they just faked it very cool but, it's kind of fun. Okay. So we'll right. see you next week. See you next week. Sounds good. Okay. See ya. Okay, bye bye. See everyone. <laughs>